Are we on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, as uh, Sophia told you guys, my, my ethnicity is Palestinian. I was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1984. And my father, as we grew in years, or as we grew and got, my, especially my father, as he grew in years and got more older, he wanted to teach us and to indoctrinate us with the ways of Islam. Now, we were raised up Islamic in America. You see, it's, the Arabic culture is much like the Jewish culture. It, it's almost similar, in fact, and it's a Semite language, a Semite culture, a Semite way of life, which that means if you're in Holland and you're Arab or Jewish, you're not from Holland, you're just living in Holland. And so that was how we were in America. And um, so the cult, there was no culture shock when my father decided to move our family to Jerusalem ethnically. That, I don't know if you, most of you probably understand the politics between Israel and the Palestinians. Well, when I was 12 in 1997, my father returned the whole family to Jerusalem. And the intention was for all of us to become better Muslims, to become better uh, acquainted with our ways, our culture, our religion. And so that's what we did. Now, for me, um, for me, it was, it, it, was a, it was a shock, to be honest with you. See, my father wanting to remove us from the Christian American culture took us to where the Christian American culture was born. And so I started seeing streets like the street of the Holy Sepulchre and, and the Via della Rosa Road. And I started seeing signs that said David's tomb. And I started seeing signs that said that had all these biblical names. And so I began to ask questions. Now, many of you know that the Islamic culture is very deep within the people. If you know any Muslims, you, you know, if they're, if they're true Muslim, you know that that's the case. So for us, it was not even, in fact, sometimes I have to pinch myself and ask myself, am I really preaching? Am, am I really a Christian? Because it was so far from our radar. My father built a five-story building before we got to Jerusalem in 1997, and he wanted it to be used as a means of, uh, as a means of income. So uh, about a year into my journey in Jerusalem, I began to have a, what I call a crisis of faith. I don't know if you've ever experienced a crisis, but a crisis is when you can't run away from the problem. Wherever you go, it's going to follow you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and even more deep than just a crisis externally, this was a crisis on the inside. Suddenly, I began to doubt and to question the very thing that made up who we were as a people and as a race. You ask any Arab man, what is the glory of the Arab society? And he'll tell you, Islam is the glory of the Arab society. And the Quran is the glorious message of, that we gave the world. In fact, there are scriptures in the Islamic doctrine that says, uh, the, the Muslim people are the, the blessing of God to the world. So for me to begin to doubt this, I was in essence doubting who I was as a person. And not only that, I was doubting my family, I was doubting my culture, and I was doubting everything I was taught. It felt like the ground that I was standing on became sinking sand. My question today is, have you ever experienced a crisis in your life? You can't run from it, you just have to wait for it to be over. Right about that time, I began, mind you, giving my heart to Islam and giving my heart to the culture and giving my heart to all of these things. I did my checklist. I prayed. I went to the mosque, the beautiful dome of the rock on, on the Temple Mount. I, I've been there many times praying, putting my head on the floor with my father, and, and that's what we did. You see, when you're seeking God, I call it the checklist. You do your checklist. If you're Jewish, whatever religion you are, you pray, you fast, you read your book. So I was doing that. I was reading the Quran. I was memorizing the verses. I was going to, in fact, I had an Islamic class every day, six days a week. I, I went to a, a school that was teaching American, in English, teaching everything that we would have to know to get our diploma and to get our high school education, but we had to have it Islamically. And so for me, at the end of the checklist is where I found myself. Now, can I, can I share something with you? And I'm not knocking any other religion, but, but do you know the fact that you feel and sense the presence of God is a miracle in and of itself? Yeah. 
Did you know that today 1.6 billion people will pray five times a day? Most of them will pray five times a day and will never sense the presence of God. And I found myself in this crisis of faith. And about that time, remember the five-story building my father brought, you know, built before we got there. There came a really nice, sweet-looking blonde lady with her husband, and she knocks on the door, and she had a southern drawl, and she said, We heard y'all were looking, were, were, had an apartment. We're looking for one. Do y'all have one? And it turns out these were Rama Bible graduate missionaries. <laughs> and my father, being a good Middle Easterner, he said, Absolutely, give me your money and move in. And so that was one, about a year, a, a little over a year into that journey. And for the next year and a half, I began to meet and get to know the happy people. I called them the happy people. <laughs> and I wish I could tell you that I was happy for them being happy, but I, I wasn't. <laughs> because I was taught things like the Jews and the, the Christians are infidels. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was such an anomaly for me. Did I say that word? Is that an anomaly? Yeah. I'm glad I didn't say Monopoly, right? Um, I, it, was such a, it was such a curiosity in me. Why are these infidels so nice? And I got to know them, and they would smile, and they, were, they, they loved Jesus, and I thought they were crazy. And so one day, I, I just fell in love with them so much so that I took my Quran upstairs, and I began to read to them what the Quran and the Islamic religion teaches about infidels and Jews and you know it was probably an awkward moment for them because I was reading them stuff that you know I just I won't even go there this morning <laughs> so I was reading to them how they were going to be eternally damned and how God had cursed the Jews and the Christians some ver in fact there is a verse in there that says that the, the Jews and Christians are descendants of apes and pigs mm. and I know how I'm a jerk aren't I like telling them to their faces, but it was what I had. I loved them. It was from a good place. And they said, Hazem, we'll have this conversation if you will promise one thing. I said, what's that? They said, we will have this conversation if you promise to never tell anybody that we're having this conversation. I looked at them being so macho, and I said, trust me, no one will ever know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to, to start any trouble, you know. And so that conversation lasted that year and a half. And towards the end, I found myself in a church in Jerusalem. First time in my life I ever went to church. Mind you, I'm still in this crisis of faith. A Muslim never goes to bed Muslim and wakes up Christian. It's just, it, we don't go to church and raise our hand every Sunday. And, you know, that's just not how we do it there. It, it, it really is a sacrificial thing to follow the Lord. And so for me, for, the, for that season I would I remember thinking okay if the if if my Christian friends really really know God if if what they're telling me is true then then what am I doing facing Mecca every f to, truthfully four times a day and it was that struggle on the inside and remember that checklist I told you about if you're if you're a sincere seeker with your checklist most people will never do the checklist most people in fact are sleeping on this Sunday morning because they're just not interested in it. The, va the vast majority of humanity is just not worried about eternity. And so for me, I was real enough and sincere enough with my own life that when I got the end, to the end of the checklist, I realized something is wrong. I really, have you ever prayed and when you're praying, the heavens seem like brass and your prayers fall right down sure. right before you? That's what it felt like. And so I started asking difficult questions. I started, I started asking, why are we supposed to dislike a certain group of people? And why, when they're so nice, I, I found out real quick that I, I was asking difficult questions nobody wanted to, to be asked. So I just internalized it. Finally, I'll fast forward to that church in Jerusalem. They said, Hazem, we're going to McDonald's. Would you like to come? I said, sure. I haven't had a Big Mac in two and a half years, um, truthfully. Uh, there's, there, was only two big, there was only two McDonald's in all of Israel at the time, and one was in Jerusalem, the other one was in, in the north, in, in Galilee, or Tel Aviv, I think. And so I said, sure, we'll, I'll go to, to, the, to McDonald's. And they said, but we're going to go to church first, so do you have a ride? Or, 
I was, I was a teenager, plus I'm not going to even try to get a ride to go to church then, to, it just didn't make sense. I said, oh, that's fine, I'll just ride with you guys. So they said, okay, we went to church. They said, you feel free to sit in the car or just meet us back here in about an hour and a half. Well, I said, don't be ridiculous, I'll go inside, this is okay, you know? So for the first time in my life, I went to church. And I went to church, I put on a big, obnoxious coat with a big hoodie so nobody sees me walking in and I, when I got in I took it off I sat in the back corner and I was amazed I saw more happy people <laughs> <laughs> I saw a man in the in the front with his guitar he was smiling looking up and he was singing to Jesus and he he was at the end of his checklist happy and I was not I saw people in the front, just like we had today, worshiping the Lord. I saw people with their hands raised up. I saw people weeping tears of joy. I saw, I saw interaction between heaven and earth. And it made me so mad. <laughs> just being honest. I was what we would call a hater, you know? Someone who's just jealous. I wish I could say I, I, I felt the, the convi- I didn't. I was in that and I got so uneasy. I said, okay. I'm, I, I, have to, I have to get rid of this emotionalism, and I need to be a good Muslim. So I pulled out my beads. Praise Allah, praise Allah, praise Allah, praise Allah, praise Allah. And then there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is His messenger. I, and I started doing the beads, that, that the, what, kind of like the Catholics have their beads, we had ours. And uh, 20 minutes later, I'm still watching them love Jesus, sing happily, and, and I'm sitting there with my beads. <laughs> and I thought, okay, this is not working, you know. So I said, okay, I, first time I ever went to a church. I said, okay, this is not, this is not okay. I, I need to pray. I, I went downstairs, found an empty room, and I faced towards Mecca, and I prayed the darkest prayer I had ever prayed. You know, Jacob wrestled with the Lord, right? That was, that was the end of my wrestle with the Lord. And here's why that prayer was dark. It wasn't because God was not there. It was because I did not want to see the God that was there. And finally, at the end of that prayer, with this righteous anger, I looked up to heaven and I said, You know what? I quit. I quit. I quit doing your job. For three years, you see me struggling to hold on to this faith that I'm supposed... I pray to heaven that you are who they said you are. And I pray to heaven that Muhammad is not a false prophet. Because I know what's before me if, I, if, this, is the, if this was reality. And I said, but nonetheless, if you are who those happy people are worshipping, I choose right now, I quit this fight, and I'm going to find the truth. So whoever you are... I'm up for grabs. And I went upstairs, and they're still happy singing and worshiping the Lord. And this time, I wasn't angry. This time, I was actually enjoying that these people who reached the end of their checklist found what they were looking for. And it was the next day, I went up to the Christians, and I said, you know what? I made this decision. I quit doing God's job. I'm going to pray. And if I have to pray in the name of Jesus, I'll just whisper it. And I'm, it'll be a secret, you know. They said, Hazim, we will do this with you. And we're, we're thrilled that you have come to this conclusion. Because they knew my struggle. They said, but we have to do one thing. I said, what's that? They said, you cannot tell a soul. I looked at them very macho and very strong. And I said, trust me, it ain't happening. I'm not telling anybody. And so for the next few years, I ended up being an underground believer. The war began in, in the year 2000, and that's when we returned to America. In the year 2000, we returned to America, and it was such a hard time in my life. It was a hard time in my life because here we were, we left America to run into, at least for me, to run into the Jewish Messiah, Jesus. And now that I actually submitted to the Jewish Messiah, now we're coming back to America. It was so confusing. And so... I, I remember the war had just really confused me. The war, you know, I was, as a Palestinian, I was being told the things that Israel was doing to the Palestinians. And none, no doubt, the Israeli channels were propagating what the Palestinians were doing. To, it was just a big mess. It was war. Nothing good can come out of war. And so I got on my knees and I said, God, 
if the Jews are your people, why are they killing my people? Now I understand it was a very biased prayer, it was a very prejudiced prayer, it was a very ignorant prayer. Nonetheless, it was my prayer. Amen. At 15 years old, it was my prayer. And suddenly I fell asleep and out of, I remember it was a dark room and out of the darkness came a man. And I thought I was, I thought, I thought I was losing my mind. This man looked like Jesus. He had a beard like Jesus. He had long hair, wavy, it wasn't straight. And by the way, he doesn't look like uh, the British guy on the movie we saw with the blue eyes. <laughs> he had a tan, he had brown eyes, and he was majestic. Mm -hmm. The best thing I can describe him as is that he was the crossover between a priest and a shepherd. And he looked at me and said, read Isaiah 22. Now, I didn't have a Bible. I, he, Isaiah, who was Isaiah? I did, he could have been a cartoon character. I had no idea. <laughs> so I, I woke up, and I, know, I knew whoever this man was in my dream was a high priest. I, I never heard that term, high priest. So I went upstairs to the Christians, and I said, I had this dream. I think it was Jesus. And this is what he said. They said, Hazem, do you have, a, you have a Bible where you can see? I, I said, I have. I couldn't have a Bible. It was not safe to have a Bible. And they said, well, we have a prophet named the prophet Isaiah. And in the Bible, he has a book, and it's called the book of Isaiah. Well, let's read it. And when I, when I began to read it in the NIV, or the message uh, translation, it was as if I was reading a newspaper. Now, not all the verses were for me, but some of them were just amazingly precise. In a time of war, Jesus shows up to me and says, read Isaiah 22. And here's... And me, with a broken heart, I pray a very biased prayer, and he responds to this very biased prayer, and he tells me, read Isaiah 22. How does Isaiah 22 begin? It says this, O city of Jerusalem, city of tumult and chaos, what is happening in your streets? You go to the rooftops to see all your men dying. At the time, we would go to the rooftops, I would go, to see the wars, to see the helicopters going back and forth, to see the stones being thrown. That's, we were in a strategic part of, of, of Jerusalem. Just about a mile or two away was the West Bank, so that was a key spot to where I could see it all from the fifth floor. And then verse 4 of Isaiah 22 ministered to me like unbelievably. Verse 4, God says, Depart from me and do not try to console me. Let me to weep bitterly for the destruction of my people. And suddenly this biased prayer is responded to by a living God who I... Remember, this is a big contrast to the guy with the checklist who never heard from God before, right? And all of a sudden, God is showing me His emotions. Sovereignly, I know what a high priest is. Isaiah 22, verse 22 says, I will give to him the keys to the house of David, and no man can, no man can open the doors that he closes, and no man can close the doors that he opens. They said, Hazem, this is a type of Jesus. And they took me to Revelation chapter 3, where, it's, where Jesus says, I am he who holds the keys to the house of David. I open doors that no man can close, and I close doors no man can open. This biased prayer was responded to in a dream by a Savior who was humble enough to come and answer it. And the solution was the man in verse 22, Jesus. So we end up coming to America. I'm... At this time, still an underground believer, I, I, at the age of 17, I just couldn't handle living a double life. So the rubber met the road, and I, I left home in the name of college. My father, being uh, the patriarch of the family, he, he thought he made a mistake by allowing me to leave for college. So he demanded I return home, and I said, I said, I can't come home. He said, Hazen, why can't you come home? First time I consciously ever disobeyed my father. I said, I can't come home because I can't live the way we've been living. And he said, if you don't be, if you're not at the house in 12 hours, don't ever look back. And that was about 12 years ago. And 12 years ago, he, since then, he has kept his word. But the Lord has brought a whole lot of, I mean, I see some of your faces, so, Trust me, it's, you don't ever get over stuff like that. You get through it, and with grace, God helps you. So I, you, you look at me, don't, don't pity me, because I, I wouldn't trade it for the world because of what I've learned walking this out. 
So to make a long story short, I ended up for the next six months sleeping my life away. I ended up watching, literally, I would, I would either listen to the radio or flip through the channels and then I would sleep for 16, 17 hours a day. I didn't know I was depressed. It's when you have no energy to get out of bed. I used to think people who said they were depressed were just whiners until I couldn't get out of bed. And one day I was flipping through the channels. There was a man on television. He was dressed in a white outfit and he was praying for people. And I thought, this guy is kind of weird, but he sounds like us. And it was Benny Hinn on television. <laughs> <laughs> so he had our accent and I, be, I just kept on watching and that voice on the inside said I have called you to this and I remember it was so deep it was, it was so loud it deafened me it was so loud and so true I knew I didn't know it was the Holy Spirit but I knew whatever this voice was it was life changing and I'm trying to get out of bed every morning and I'm supposed to preach. I had no idea what, the, what that meant later, and I'll, I'll connect the dots for you. So I turned the TV off, and I did what I knew to do. I escaped it. I went back to bed. But something supernatural happened the next morning that I can't explain. At 8 in the morning, I woke up with a desire to get out of bed. And suddenly, I wasn't depressed anymore. Even though, in my mind, I had rejected the thought my body had responded to the purpose that God had spoken to me. And uh, it, the details are, I'll spare you the details, but to make a, a long story short, I began to get plugged into the local church. I started doing the faithful, boring things that we, you know, the checklist, pray, fast, watch, keep this submitted to the Lord. And before no time, I started meeting right, the, the right people at the right time, favor, mix in some favor in there. And here I am, I'll, we'll fast forward to about three years ago. Three years ago, I'm now working for Dr. Paul Crouch from TBN. And Paul Crouch says to me, he goes, Hazem, I, I have this feeling that you should be doing television. I said, Dr. Crouch, I, I have this feeling that you are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, not connecting the dots from when that voice spoke to me. And for three months, we went back and forth. He, he kept on telling me, the Lord, I feel the Lord saying, you need to do this. And because of fear, I rejected it. And one day he said, Hazim, I have presented to you an opportunity. I pray you have the wisdom to make the right choice. And so at that word right there, it just struck me because I realized I had gotten to the end of the rope. And now I had to make a decision whether to put feet to my faith or to resist the opportunity. You know, you could pray for 20 years, Lord, use me, Lord, use me, Lord, use me. And one day, the Lord's going to say, okay, I'm ready to use you. And we're going to have to decide to get up off of our knees and to actually walk towards whatever God is calling us to do. And that's where I was. And so from that point on, the, the Lord, I surrendered to the Lord. I ended up praying about it for two weeks, and the Lord gave me Isaiah 65, verse 1. I had never, never heard this verse in there. But it, it basically says this. He goes, I have revealed, God says, I revealed myself to those who were not even looking for me. I have said to those who, who were not called by my name, I said, here I am, here I am. And I had a word from the Lord. And I had a promise from God that if you step out in faith and preach the word, I will step in and answer their cries. So, to make a long story, I know I keep saying that, the story is not getting any shorter, right? <laughs> um, I ended up praying for the Lord to tell me what to say, and it, the Lord said, give them John 3.16. And I thought, how simple is that? I want to give them revelation. I don't want to give them John 3.16, right? And what I found out because of my obedience to following what I felt in my heart, the Lord, the Lord started coming through. And I realized that most of the Arab world have never heard of John 3.17 or 3.16. And so now what, the wisdom of the Lord was that He totally is coming through on this thing. When He gave me Isaiah 65, 1, I can show you stories, emails, letters. I even got a few just recently. And here's the thing. We sit in church and we're like, wow, praise the Lord. God, God connected the dots. So I have called you to this. Remember that word? Now I'm preaching the gospel on television and I'm kind of like a younger version of that guy I saw on television. The dots connected. 
Now, that's great here in church, but on the other side of the world or on the other side of the city, there's, a, there's, a, there's other people who don't believe like us who would get agitated at that story. In fact, I have a picture I want to show you. Because of the platform, because now Reflections airs in two languages 23 times a week on six different channels, and it's, it's increasing the favor. If, I'm on Facebook, by the way, so you may have seen this picture. This picture was about a few months ago when all of the craziness in Egypt started happening. They started persecuting the, 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 the believers. This man right here is burning a Bible. And if you see, you see the, the police right there, they're just letting it happen. And every, it seems like they're kind of just encouraging this guy to do this. So I thought, what would I tell that one man? What would I tell him? Because it, it, it irked me on the inside that the police are just standing there. Now, I posted on Facebook, I said, you can burn our Bible, but you can never burn Jesus. You can never burn the message. You can, you can burn that paper, but the message will never go away. Now that's a pretty, if you ask me, that's a pretty awesome statement, right? It, it wasn't meant to be like an anti-Islamic thing. It was just meant to be, this is what we believe. And because of that one picture, I got an influx of emails and hate mail. And I just got, and I, re, I, I prayed. I said, Lord, why something that simple caused such an uproar? And I began to, I, honestly, I felt intimidated because I'm thinking, I'm just preaching the gospel and they're getting angry because he's, they're burnt. Look, that man, not there, they're not all b burning our Bibles, but that man was burning our Bible. And so the Lord took me to John chapter 20. He said, Hazim, this is what it's going to take for people like that man to stop burning the Bible. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I won't read all of the verses. I'll tell you where I'm reading. Early Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple. They have taken away the Lord's body out of the tomb. Peter and the other disciple ran to see. Verse 8, Then the other disciple went in, he saw, and he believed. For until then they hadn't realized that the scripture said he would rise from the dead. Verse 11, Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped in and looked, and she saw two white-robed angels sitting at the head and the foot of the place where Jesus had been lying. Why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied. And I don't know where they have put him. Have you ever wondered where Jesus was in your situation? Sure. Have you ever wondered where the living Messiah is in your life? No doubt she was in this place. She glanced over her shoulder and saw someone standing there, standing behind her, and it was Jesus, but she did not recognize him. The praise team, you guys can come up real quick. She did not recognize him. Why are you crying, Jesus? Red letters. And who are you looking for? Now, isn't it amazing that red letters of Jesus, she's looking for Jesus. He's speaking right to her, red letters, and she does not recognize him. You see, all over the Muslim world, they say we recognize Jesus, but they don't recognize him. One of the, the, one of the most, for me, one of the most wearisome conversations is when I have to tell my Muslim friends, you don't believe in Jesus. You believe in the version that you created in your Quran. That's who you believe in. You don't believe in the Son of You believe in a man. It's intriguing to me. Why are you crying? She's looking for Jesus and he's talking to her. Have you ever, have you ever been looking for Jesus and not recognized that he was right there with you in your situation? She thought he was the gardener, she said. Sir, if... If you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. And Jesus said to her one word. One word. One word. He didn't preach to her. He didn't give her the Sermon of the Mount. He didn't give her the, 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 the doctrine. No. He didn't give her a TV show. He didn't give her a Bible. He gave her one word. 
So what does it take for the Muslim people to know that Jesus Christ is the Lord? It's one word. And that one word is this. Jesus looks at her and he says, Mary. He calls her by her name. And immediately it says, she turned towards him and she exclaimed, Teacher, capital T. And Jesus said, I have not yet ascended, but go and tell everybody that I'm ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. What does it take for the Muslim world to recognize Jesus? It takes the Muslim world to hear the living Savior call out their name because Allah never called out their name. Muhammad, that's, right. that's a different story. Right. Don't... <laughs> and listen to what she says next. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene found the disciples and she told them, I, I have seen the Lord. And I found, I found it really amazing in my, wa in my experience with reflections and the program and ministering to, the, to, to two worlds. I found that he's so kind to reveal himself, like he said in Isaiah 65, 1. I have revealed myself to people who were not even looking for me. I can take you to the place where I met an underground Bible study in Jerusalem. And I looked to the brother on my right and I said, how did you come to know the Lord? And mind you, I'm supposed to be telling them how missionaries intercepted me in a crisis of faith and yada. And I look at him and I say, I say, how did you come to the Lord? He said, oh, well, Jesus came to me. What does that mean, Jesus came to you? I didn't want to put him on the spot. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't want him to feel, I said, can you explain to me what that means, Jesus came to, to you? And he said, just like you're sitting there, I saw him. I could touch him, I could feel him, and Jesus took me to, the, to Jerusalem, to the southern steps, and said, he pulled out the, the, a book from the stone, and he said, he said, preach my word. He said, at that moment, I knew he was the son of God. Me being utterly humbled, I, I, missionaries intercepted me, Jesus came to him. I said, praise God. I looked over trying to run from that, I, I said, and the sister on my left says, she goes, oh, because she recognized my utter shock. And she says, oh, Hazem, most of us have come to the Lord through dreams and visions. And I said, well, how did you come? She said, for a year, I would have the dream of the man dressed in white. And there was so much light around him, I couldn't see him, but I knew there was one man in that light. She said, for, for, that, for that year, I didn't know what, who this was. I called him the light. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, right, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. You want, you want to see what God is doing in the Muslim world? Turn off the news and start praying and seeing it by the Spirit. Because what we are seeing is a whole different situation than what the news is saying. I determined I'm not going to let the news tell me what's happening in the Middle East. I'm going to let the Holy Ghost tell me, right? So I encourage you today, if you are bored with your faith in Jesus, I, I implore you. He could be speaking right to you and you not recognize him. Today, what are you going to do to recognize Jesus? I'm almost sure, I'm 100% I'm, I'm sure that if you would listen just a little bit, you can hear him. Not calling my name, not calling your neighbor's name, but calling your name. God bless you guys. Thank you.